Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to uh, the CM Today webinar, where we're talking about uh, facility management in the age of AI and automation. Now, the webinar is organized by CM Today magazine and sponsored by Initial Saudi Group. The Initial Saudi Group is a leading multinational IFM service provider based in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. The company offers the strengths and the experience of a multinational while retaining the agility and the characteristics of a local company. Now, coming to the discussion today, last year has pushed all of us to be extremely agile, and I'm sure all of you will agree with me when I say this, that a key aspect that truly overpowered itself during the pandemic was breakneck speed, at which technology took over and made an impact in the built environment. Now, when we look at the FM market in the kingdom, it's needless to say that the sector has seen a huge growth. Now, in fact, there have been many reports that have stated that the FM accounts for more than 55% of the regional market, making it one of the largest FM markets in the Gulf region. Now, we not only saw a rise in the number of technology solutions in the market, but also the way in which the FM service was delivered with the help of advanced technology. Now, today here, we're talking about, you know, the transformation stage that we have seen in the kingdom and the kind of impact that the FM sector had with respect to automation, AI, and software. So joining me today uh, are three very interesting speakers. So let me introduce them to you, starting with Mr. Mohammed Musa, the Chief Operating Officer of Initial Saudi Group, a leading FM service provider in the kingdom. Now, he brings with him over 15 years of experience in the built environment, of which he has spent close to five years in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Joining us also today, this afternoon, uh, is Mr. Rob Stringer, is, who is the head of professional services at FSI FM Solutions Middle East. Now, he has been with FSI for over 25 years and been based in London, Hong Kong, and Dubai, with the last 11 years being in the Middle East. Now, Mr. Rob oversees the project delivery and the support teams throughout the MENA region with a focus on the KSA market. Now, Rob has a computer science background and is a technology enthusiast following closely to, with the trends within the FM industry and the wider appeal. Also joining us in the panel is Mr. Glenn Yates, the Middle East Regional Lead for Shepherd, which is a UK headquartered building performance AI analytical platform that delivers true value in the built environment value chain that is adopted by property portfolio owners, operators, service providers, and risk managers. So thank you, gentlemen, for joining us this afternoon and taking time out for the webinar. Thank you very much. Great. So before we begin, I'd like to inform everyone that uh, you know we want to make this webinar as engaging as possible. So we'd like to invite the audience to post in your questions or even your thoughts uh, in the question uh, column so that I can address them to our speakers during the course of the discussion. So let's start off. So I want to start off by asking all three of you this question. Now, earlier I spoke about this whole digital transformation. Now it's become quite a common thing in the workplace right now. But how is the industry viewing this right now? And especially what is the contrast in the digital initiatives that we are seeing now compared to you know, what we call the pre-pandemic era. Who would like to start off? Yeah, I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> um, That'd be great. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'd certainly, yeah, from, from our point of view, the, the, the technical aspects were, were progressing. Um, and I think what, what, what COVID has, has done, is, um, as it has done with, with a lot of areas of, of people's lives, is just sort of speed up the, the adoption. Um, I think there's things that we were doing now that uh, that we weren't doing before, but but the technology was there before. But this this pandemic has just given us the push to uh, um, to do it because of the, the necessity. Um, and then certainly from our side, we, we've seen a lot of um, enhancements purely for solving sort of COVID related issues, but it's also pushed forward other other issues as well. Right. Makes sense. Uh, adding to like from uh, from uh, from initial solid group prospect as a service provider, before the COVID nineteen, there was uh, a want for technology. We wanted to have the technology backlight. We want to see the 
throughout the COVID-19 and the pandemic, this has uh, created a need that now the service needs to implement and embed technology in the service provided to our clients. Taking the consideration that we have you now the pandemic is hit, like the map power and all the strains that we have for flies and all that kind of things, which uh, forced most of the service provided, even the clients, to think out of the box and start implementing technology. So we believe uh, from so many prospects that the clients start feeling that there is a huge need for that and there is now uh, a demand of having that and the accessibility as well as robots. In fact, now we have the technology for having webinar, Zoom and other softwares that we can use to make our life easier. So this is from, uh, from our point of view. Great, yeah. great. And so I think digital transformation is a, is a suitcase phrase. I think it's been banded around for, for many a year now. And I think it means different things to different people. I think in certain organizations, digital uh, transformation can be as simple as taking a paper process and making an electronic form. To other organizations, it can be full automation and AI enablement of, of full uh, enterprise wide processes. So we, we really have to be careful when we say digital transformation to really understand what it means to the, the customer, the client, and, and the service provider. Uh, but you're absolutely right, you know, there's the, the common phrase, uh, which C was the biggest accelerator towards digital transformation? Was it your CEO? Was it the COO or was it COVID? And I think we can all agree that uh, while digital transformation and automation and AI were, were spoken about uh, due to COVID, then there's been a, a massive acceleration in terms of adoption. Uh, and, and because of that, there's also an acceleration towards the value that uh, digital transformation drives uh, as well throughout the value chain uh, in, in the FM space. Right. But when we look at the kingdom in specific, uh, what kind of uh, transformation have you all seen, especially during this COVID time? Or do you feel that it has been on par with the rest of the world as well? Uh, working outside of, I'll take this one, working outside of the kingdom as well, it gives me a, a wider view on what's happening internationally and, and throughout the GCC. Um, I think Saudi is, is driving ahead uh, and is certainly catching up to sort of more mature uh, markets like the UAE, for example, uh, and, and Western markets. And I think that's been driven by a couple of things. Obviously, there's great initiatives uh, with the Department of Digital Transformation. You've got uh, also major smart projects such as NEOM and the Red Sea projects and, and other uh, major projects which are, they don't have infrastructure debt, which means they can be built from the ground up. And they're really mm -hmm. focused on supporting the citizen uh, experience. And from that, they can have a blank piece of paper and really drive technological uh, innovation into those regions, so actually catching up and, and surpassing some of the other major players. Right. Uh, my next question would be to both of you, Mr. Green and Mr. Roth. Uh, when we look at the technological standpoint of you, you know, what do you believe have been the kind of the demand drivers in the facility management industry in Saudi? Um, I, I think it's yeah, so around. Rob, do you want to take that one? Yeah, yeah. Um, it's certainly... Oh, he's frozen. Okay, <laughs> he's frozen. So I think we just mentioned some of them. Uh, I, I think obviously there's a lot of initiatives. Oh, no, no, I think he's fine. But... That's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. I think there's a lot of initiatives. Uh, that Go ahead, Mr. Yeah. Um, Okay. Uh, yes, I think there's a lot of initiatives that have been driven by uh, by the kingdom, by the government, uh, in terms of the, the vision uh, plans and the strategy of uh, diversification from obviously the, uh, the the oil revenues. I, I think there's there's amazing initiatives in terms of the new cities, both north, uh, west, and and, and south. Um, obviously, the, the the new things that are happening in Jeddah as well. Uh, the the focus on citizen satisfaction and citizen experience in terms of that digital engagement uh, with the kingdom uh, through multiple platforms uh, rather than the old paper process face to face. Um, COVID has, has, has absolutely accelerated that. Uh, and that has sort of driven, really driven um, sort of insights and um, appetite for moving towards that, that digital platforms uh, that, are, that are needed to support the initiative. Mm. Mr. Rob, would you like to add to that? Yeah, sure. Um, 
I mean, certainly from 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 our point of view, what we're what we're hearing from um, you know clients that are, uh, we're issuing tenders to, um, it, AI is mentioned quite a lot, IoT, um, and as opposed to I think a few years ago, when we were sort of the the buzzword. I know it's still there, um, but uh, yeah, it, it was certainly there in basically every proposal that we're asked for. Um, but it's now moving. Yeah, so IoT has become a bit more prevalent. Um, certainly, yeah, looking at mobility, but also from a, you know, a technician's or delivery point of view, but also from from the end user point of view. Um, so yeah, I think everybody's getting used to using apps now um, for ordering food, taxis, booking services, all kinds of things. Um, and, and having an app for, for FM delivery, um, certainly for the residential market, um, but also even in some of the sort of office spaces and, and commercial environments, um, you know, having company apps to um, to provide certain services is, is becoming more and more of a, a trend from, from what we're seeing. Yeah. And Mr. Musa, we've heard all of all these kind of solutions that are kind of making an impact, but According to you, you know, how are these likely kind of uh, to impact the future of the market growth in the FM industry? Uh, for like, like after listening to, to my colleagues in over discussing about the technology, you know, in Saudi Arabia, if you look into that, the both facility management services, hard and soft services, we can understand that the technology has uh, a great impact on driving this uh, this business in the growth of the clinic, uh, the, client, uh, the client as well as the service provider. And taking into consideration the apps that uh, my colleague has spoken about, 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 like now more more of the clients now they have accessibility to the internet. So now the clients start acting more and more as a as a value value added service. He's not looking for the same way of doing the service. He's not looking to have 100 people coming to the site, doing the same services, going back there and consuming. He's looking now for doing the business totally, totally different. And we can see that from Neom, we can see that from uh, Red Sea project, uh, from the airport. The clients start now demanding more quality and they are as well they're expecting now by implementing this kind of technology, we are going to drive our cost more and more down which will increase our efficiency, however, with less cost. So these are the future that we believe that we are going to, 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 to see more in our uh, in the services of facility management in Saudi Arabia. Right. You know, um, I just hold on to that, Mr. Musa, where we were seeing that the role of technology has kind of uh, jumped multifold post the pandemic. So I want to ask from your point of view, what are the facility management of the managers seeking from technology providers and how can we kind of be tech first FM to add that more value to the end clients? Uh, this is a good question actually. As, uh, as you know, like, technology, it's, it's wide, it's wide. Uh, you can find everything in technology. You can have the expensive, you can have the cheap, you can have. The first thing that the facility management service provider or partners of our client, we are looking for a technology that can be easy to be used. We are not looking for a technology that can make the life harder or can create another flow into the operation. So from, from FM, like if you look at into the hard services, we are more into IoT now, sensors, to have big data control rooms that we can control, multi-sites, multi-operation from one area, from one point. As well, we need something because don't do not forget that Saudi Arabia is a development uh, underdeveloping and there are like the mega projects going on so still the, the manpower or the expertise to deal with the with the technology it's not up to that to that maturity yet so therefore we need to have a technology that can take it gradually we're not expecting to have everything once and we say okay now we are fully automated but we don't have the users to use that uh, technology therefore we are looking at an FM prospect that to have a technology can match the need and can grow gradually during the time, and we build up the expertise to use that technology. And as well, we are ex expecting something to have a very decent return over investment, because we are not expecting to have very high technology, costly technology, that will not be able to be implemented. 
I will just add one thing because most of the contracts not yet been done for five years or long. We call it long term contracts, which your return over investment will be made after a certain period. Most of the contracts are still three years, sometimes one year. So the implementation of the technology from cost or the capex wise is still a challenge. Hmm. Right. I, I, We've just I, taken a yeah. Sorry. I, I, I would absolutely echo that as well. I mean, from a Technology provider point of view. That's exactly what we're we're finding. Um, you know, companies are buying CAFM or CMS for for the first time. Um, you know, we've been selling systems for, for thirty years, but you know, in, in the mature markets, they may be buying their second or third system or iteration. Certainly in Saudi, it's they're doing it for the first time, um, and and you've got to get that that foundation right and and the depth of knowledge within a within an organization to actually operate that system and understand the benefits of it. That's right. We, in fact, have a question that's very similar to what uh, you had just mentioned as well from Mr. Sean Heckford, who says the kingdom has some amazing projects ongoing, and I have yet to see some much evidence from clients grasping the concept of AI and automation in FM. Now, spe uh, specifically, have any of the panelists had any direct experience of clients engaging in this sort of uh, technology? Would anyone like to answer that? I mean, or each one of you can give your... Actually, uh, like yesterday, I had a meeting with one of our clients. We have been newly awarded a project in the Central and Eastern region. So yesterday, we had a meeting with, uh, with the managing director of, of the project. And actually, I was so surprised that to see that even the client themselves, they start implementing their own app, that they need to, to start the integration between the apps and our CAFM system, which actually mm -hmm. it was the first time actually to be in a meeting that the client start demanding that we need to go with different and high level of technology to be, to be implemented in our operations. When you have this kind of, of a clients, I believe from every, from facility management, sales provider, from, IT, uh, from technology solution, it will make the life easier because the client, he knows exactly what he wants and he will understand the time frame that you need to develop that kind of technology to serve his operation. So this is from my uh, latest experience. Yeah. Yeah. Mr. Roth, would you like to add to that? Yeah, I, I think when it comes to um, AI, um, I think we sort of confuse the, the, the definition of, of of really what AI is. It could be um, just predictive maintenance and, and automatic allocation of, of resources to a task. Um, and that's something that you can you can do by building rules into to the CAFM system and, and, and monitoring certain parameters. It sort of gives the impression that it's AI. Um, and, and, and I think that's that's probably the stage that, that, that people are at at the moment. Sort of moving away from maybe planned maintenance to predictive maintenance and automatic allocation of, of resources um, to complete mm -hmm. work. Okay. Uh, Mr. Glynn, if you can put your mic on, we're not able to see you. We'll come back to, and I hope maybe you can uh, rejoin if it's not working. Uh, and just adding one more, uh, maybe regarding the artificial intelligence. Uh, yeah. Also, the definition, as uh, as Robert said, the definition of artificial intelligence is huge. You can have equipment artificial intelligence. You can have system artificial intelligence. But what what control our our definition is also the cost and how willing the client is to invest in this artificial intelligence. Because some artificial intelligence they are there, but the, the, the availability or the quality of the service given are not yet proven. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you need to, to, to manage this expectation of the artificial intelligence, and then you need to bring the reality into what's happening into the business. Because not, right. we, all, we all would need to, to manage the expectation. Right, that's so true. So uh, there's one more question that has come up. So let's take that on as well. Um, so so we've got a, how much, how would you assess the maturity of the MENA prop tech sector in terms of awareness and readiness to adopt 
smart parking solutions as one of the aspects of property management and flexible space allocation. Would that be something that you would like to address right now? Just we just I need to see the yeah. Uh, regarding flexible space allocation. Yeah, this this is something right. that we've been asked quite a lot about. Um and, and certainly in terms of you know the way that offices are gonna are being used is, is now different. Um and having sort of a space management solution that allows um, you to input rules that are sort of around the, the COVID requirements, so distance between workstations, that, that sort of thing, that can all be planned in, in your in space management software. Um, other things that we've been asked for is things like um, uh, desk booking, so where you don't have 100% of your your staff in, a, in an office all the time now, and it's you know, more flexible with, with home working, that, that potentially they book space to come into an office and, and obviously then the system allocates the appropriate desks based on enough space between them for, for social distancing. So yeah, that, that's certainly mm -hmm. a topic that, that, that's come up in the last year or so. Mm -hmm. um, adding adding to, to, uh, to that, especially for the parking solution, smart parking solution, I was speaking from Saudi Arabia, I know like the parking in Saudi Arabia now is becoming like hustle, especially like in the, in, in the capital of Riyadh, and not more, not more, like not most of the, the towers they have sufficient number of, of parking to match the spaces that they have in their offices. And I believe like if if, if that if the answer for the maturity, the maturity is still I think that we're still in the beginning. Still, there is more to be done and more to be invested in. And actually, I believe the investors and the asset owners now, they start understanding the space, the net usage of the space is very important. Previously, it, the land were available, you can take any space that you're looking for, so the cost was not high compared to today. Today, the cost of land is increasing. So as much as you get out from the space that you are using, it's going to have more return over investment. So I believe that maturity was still in the beginner level maturity there is a lot to be invested in okay we've got a couple of more questions we'll come back to that uh i hope mr glenn if you can hear us or if you would like to just test your mic uh yeah i i hope you can hear me uh, i think you've lost video yeah Apologies for that. yeah great no problem we can at least we can hear you so let's just get on to the next question now we've spoken about this whole digital transformation we've spoken about the kind of demand drivers that are there uh, in the saudi market and also the kind of value that we can add to the end users now i want to ask all of you that you know what are some of the key digital initiatives that uh, all of you have viewed would set the facility management on a path to a wider success in changing the market conditions today Okay. Um, yeah, I'll take that, that first. I think um, Mohammed sort of uh, touched on it a bit earlier about the sort of yeah. uh, the requirement for sort of input and, and output specification. So rather than you know having a hundred people turn up to to a site, that that you're you deal with that on a smarter basis. That it's more quality driven, um, and then sort of to be able to do that and for the for the client to to be aware of, of what's happening. Um, obviously, you have, have to have a system in there to, to collect all that information and, and show that um, the client is getting value from, from the services that are being delivered. Um, so things like um, performance management systems, putting those in place to, to manage the, the services that are being delivered. Um, I say it's an initiative, but, but mobile solutions for um, tracking jobs, seeing when, when work is completed, and, and giving the client the, the full transparency of you know, when people, uh, when technicians started the work, when they finished the work, um, you know, having backup information like, like pictures and so on to show that, that work has been done. Um, and then reporting that, and dashboarding that comes out of that to show that you know, you're delivering a quality service and, and that, that service is not necessarily determined by the number of 
bodies that you're putting on site. It's, it's determined by the quality of the, the solution that you're providing. Right. Mr. Green, would you like to answer that as well? Yeah, I think it all drives from um, the operational credence um, that an organization puts into play. You know, we, we can talk about workforce uh, efficiency and, and that's one of the drivers. But I think it all starts from insights into the business and the services that you're providing in, in the value chain. Uh, what we what we tend to find, I, I was sat with a, uh, a customer the other day and they had a lot of silo systems, a lot of silo mm -hmm. projects. And it was very difficult for that organization to have a, an overriding holistic view on their entire operation. And Mr. Mohammed mentioned earlier about managing things from one central operation center. Uh, and it, that's, that's absolutely key and critical to have that view across from, from, uh, from a, a portfolio wide down to a cluster, down to a project, down to a city, down to an asset, down to a component. To have the ability to drill down and, and also scale up across uh, wide portfolios and making sure that you, the standards you are set, the SLAs that you need to deliver for the delight of your customer is consistent and deliverable uh, across your enterprise and across your entire service, uh, services portfolio. Right. Uh, Mr. Monson, you want to add to... Yeah, actually, like uh, my colleagues here, they have covered like, like the initials that we have uh, You know, like the clients today in Saudi Arabia, they are more into transparency, they want to, to, to understand the operation, what's happening in reality, and they want to have accessibility for the KPI and SLAs for the service provided at any time, if you have at the service. And the whole idea of facility management is resource management, that we need to manage our resources. So one thing that to, in order for you to, to have a great accessibility is to have a mobile app, which can give you the asset life cycle, can give a dashboard to the client, with the, with the clear reporting, as well to have an understanding about the movement of your uh, of your manpower, because you know, like in any project, you are deploying in the beginning, but during the the, the age of the project, you start redeploying, which is very good for the client to have accessibility over that data. So these are the initiatives that we look at uh, in facility management for uh, technology. Yeah. Thank you for that. Let's just get into some more questions that we've got from the audience. So we've got an interesting question saying that between the client and the service provider, who should really invest in AI and automation? Quite a simple and logical question, isn't it? <laughs> simple, though it's complicated, actually. <laughs> so, you know, I will discuss like like a lot of my things, like because like as a service provider, we always see that. The client he adds that he adds that in in, uh, in the RFP in the request for proposal, so he always adding like that that element of innovation. But always you're going to see it innovation, sustainability, innovation, sustainability. But in reality, like it's a cost. And as I said, if the client is going to give us a three years contract, that now he will now the cost is going to go bigger because if I if I want to cover the cost of my innovation, the data, IoT, all that kind of things, I need to have longer time. So answering that, if the contract given by the client is seven years and above, the service provider should take the initiative and start investing because it's a long-term contract. If the contract five years and less, from my point of view, I believe the investment should be 50-50 between the service provider as well as the client. Anyone else would like to add? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that as well. Um, I don't think there's any one particular answer who it should be because both of them can look at this from different angles. Uh, I mean, you look at, you can look at the portfolio owners and operators, and, and they will look at it from an asset management perspective, for example, uh, and a citizen experience perspective. You can look at it from the, the service providers, uh, and they can uh, streamline their um, their efficiency to improve their SLAs, create and manage their contractors, and uh, and manage that side of the, the value um, the value chain what and, and it works for, for both uh, from a from an FM perspective it would be great to have an overriding platform that if you go and inherit uh, an, an, an in situ system that doesn't give you that intelligence that you need that you can just plug that straight in and automatically you've got your standardized operational system so 
um, you, you can have it as, uh, as your own core offering that you can utilize whatever system you inherit, both today and tomorrow, to again strap out uh, the, the differences. Um, and what we're looking at here is, is the difference in, I think, data consolidation and aggregation uh, is, is mm -hmm. getting there, and that gives you data. I think uh, sort of the actionable insights on that is getting to the information layer. Uh, but what we're actually all talking about is, is how do we bring in automation intelligence to get you to the knowledge layer? And so you can have that knowledge layer for the, uh, for the, the building operators, or you can have that knowledge layer at the service level, but they're not, uh, then, then they don't have to be dis distinct. Mm. Thank you so much for that. And I hope that answers your question, uh, Ms. Nuzin. So we also have one more question. Let me take that in before we get back to our discussion. Uh, uh, Ms. Barbara says that there's some great points that have been mentioned on cost saving, on easy usage, accessibility. But who do you see are most likely supporting these new automated solutions? Are it the owners, the investors, the FM teams, or consultants or contractors? I think that's pretty much the, uh, the same question, isn't it? Um, yeah. I think um, you know, when it comes to the to automation, if, if that is allowing the, the, the service providers to provide a, a better, more cost-effective solution um, mm -hmm. to their clients, then, then it, it should be the service provider that uh, is, is, you know, is making that investment. But again, that goes back to you know, the sort of input output specifications of contract. You know, it shouldn't really be the client specifying you've got to have AI. It should be the fact that the service provider is going to use it or use automation, use AI to deliver a better service, which then enables them to you know, increase the quality and, and reduce the cost. Um, I'm, I'm not sure it should necessarily be the the end client that's specifying. Um, you, know, you need to use this technology. It should be about the the quality of the service that's been being delivered. And I think to to echo that, Rob, I think you're absolutely right. Um, no, no, what what we used to find was that service providers used to stick to the RFP conditions and and deliver that. And I, I think customers now are more demanding. Uh, it's not realistically and, and and still about fulfilling a contract. I, I think FM service providers like an initial. Uh, should be seen as trusted advisors in that advisory capacity you know how mr customer let us show you how we can deliver this better to you uh for for everyone's benefit rather than just responding to an rfp that you published and so mm -hmm. I, I think we need to turn from uh, from just fulfillers to to advisors as well yeah but i yeah, think uh, at this stage is that uh, something that we can introduce in saudi is it something that you know, your end users, Mr. Musa, would accept as just an advisory. Yeah, actually, actually, surprised that, like, like, I totally agree with uh, Robert and Glenn about the way that they have uh, uh, introduced that. You know, like, in, currently, in previous RFPs, I would say it would be hard. Previously, it was really hard because the client was mostly demanding certain number of staff, certain number of services, that it didn't have any input of overviewing that. And this is all changed after the pandemic. The client now is giving you the freedom. So he will he will give you the freedom because he will look at you as the expert, as a reference. So here you can start dictating the way that needs the job to be to be fulfilled. Like I can do the job with 10 people, but if I'm applying this kind of, of technology, I can do it with two people with, the, with this time. So the client actually, through, uh, through the, your technical writer, and this is where the technical writer plays a big role in our, in our submission. The technical writer can give the client a very clear understanding about the method and the technology that we will implement and deploy in this project. And he can see now why he will go with X, not go with Y, and now not with Z. As long as the client will not give you the number of stuff to do the job, yeah. Now you have the right to be as a reference, uh, as an expert in facility management or technology to provide that advice to your client. Right, it's quite interesting. I'm coming to my next question. Um, you know, with, there's a lot of talk about you know real time tracking in facilities management that has been doing its rounds for a while right now. 
So when is Saudi in this respect? From service provider, like like I say, like still still we are in in, in early stages. Mm -hmm. uh, we have seen a couple of, of initiatives like uh, lately with Neom and and implement this kind, but also that we need to understand the infrastructure to to have this kind of uh, of technology. As well, you need to see the uh, is it com uh, is it applicable to be used in, in different areas, and we believe that this. This is still we are in early stages. Still, there is a, a, a room for uh, for investment and uh, and development in that uh, in that technology, uh, but it's very important because we are talking about a big spaces that we are covering, big mega facilities that this kind of technology are are really needed. But still, we are in early stages to the point. Uh, this is from my point of view, but my my colleagues they can add to it. Yeah. Um, I would agree with you. It's certainly at the early stages. Um, I mean, certainly just, just giving um, you know, the technicians mobility so you can track individual jobs, that, that that's um, an easy step towards it. Um, I, I'm not sure whether that would be you know, real time that the client would see it in, in, in like an Uber type display where they can see technicians moving around and, and you know, fixing jobs. I don't think um, you know, we're necessarily at that level yet. Um, but but certainly using mobility to to, to track you know, attendance or um, fixed times and things like that, that that's certainly certainly key. Yeah. Mr. Green, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, sure. I, I think my, my colleagues have, uh, have covered most things. I, I think um, the kingdom is at the start of this journey, uh, uh, especially in the uh, in the FM and built environment space. There's there's a long way to go, uh, but there's there's definite appetite uh, for that uh, as the as the market matures, the built environment matures, uh, and the big the big building budget battle, and everyone tries to see because value means different things to the tenants, to the service providers, to the building operators, and it, it's getting that balance. And if if technology can accelerate that. Uh, and deliver that value uh, quicker and cost effectively. Uh, so, you know, efficiency doesn't necessarily mean, uh, mean saving cost. It means use, using your resources to the best of its ability to improve services. So, I think we need to shift away from the, the mentality of saving costs to enhancing the, the, the service delivery and capabilities and SLAs and the experience of the, uh, of the consumers. Um, but there's, there's, there's some way to go. Uh, but it's going to be an exciting, uh, exciting ride over the next uh, 12 to 24 months. Yeah, right. That's what rightfully said. So, you know, coming to my next question, I wanted to ask, you know, what measure can one take in order to maximize these new digital tools uh, in order to deliver the best FM service, but at the same time, you know, helping to protect the environment? Uh, for, um, from an environmental perspective, obviously, we're talking about sustainability. Um, yeah. and when you, whenever you're talking about efficiency, you're talking about sustainability. Whether whether that is uh, optimizing the consumable use for your for your workforce, whether that's internally uh, driving down your your energy usage and becoming more more carbon uh, carbon uh, friendly, whether that's extending life cycles of assets uh, through asset life cycle management. Uh, so. A lot of it is is really from a sustainability place in helping the environment. Uh, I think by uh, yeah optimizing your workforce, making sure uh, the closest people are going to the right jobs with the right consumables, uh, will 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 help on that as well. Um, so whichever way you look at it, that's that's helping the environment. Yeah, I, I think also the um, the use of, of IoT sensors um, that that can also also help. Mm. That sort of thing. Uh, I mean, we've certainly done projects where um, you've, you've had meeting room usage. Um, and, and it's probably a very, a very minor part of <laughs> environmental, but um, yeah, if it's linked to to a CAFM system and and you book meeting rooms through the CAFM system, that can also be linked to IoT devices or BMS, um, and you don't chill the room if nobody's in it. You don't turn the lights on if nobody's in it. Um, if there's a booking, then 
you know, the system will automatically call the room 15 minutes before people are, are due to attend and turn the lights on. Um, so it's, it's those sort of initiatives using using technology to deliver that kind of solution. Uh, adding to that in sustainability, like you know, like in Saudi Arabia, the like the energy like for ACs, for chillers, for water consumption, and especially water consumption is very high uh, concern now in Saudi Arabia. I mean, like, uh, Everyone saw, like in the last couple of months, there were like many initiatives to reduce the, the, the water usage. So, using using such as uh, IoT systems, sensors, all of and, and and the BMS actually, it can it can reduce the misuse again, misuse of water supply, misuse of, uh, of of the chiller and energy. And here, where the technology will play big role, not only for uh, for an efficiency as as a as a performance of operation. As well, taking into consideration the, the misuse of our uh, water, as well the chemicals that use in soft services. As you know, like the soft services, a big portion, 70% of facility management of soft services. Yeah. So having deployment of the right technology, the right equipment, this will eliminate the misuse or abuse of this kind of chemicals which will impact our environment. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Rob, there is a question for you. Uh, from Mr. Sean, he says that he was quite intrigued by the statement that you made uh, referring to the CAPM system that could be configured to transition from PPM to predictive condition. So, what is the technology behind this? Is something that we um, Well, so obviously, a, a PPM is, is is scheduled on a um, on a cyclical basis. So, you might go every every month to go and. Um, Look at the units. Um, with, with predictive maintenance, you can use IoT technology. Um, so, if it was a, mo a motor or a pump or something, you might monitor the vibration of it. You might monitor the the power consumption. Um, it, it, it could be a, um, a sensor on a filter that, that checks the flow over a particular filter. So, you can then set the thresholds for um, creating a task or needing a task to be um, created and sent out to a technician. So instead of them going every month and doing you know, the same job and dismantle it and put it back together, the, the actual IoT sector and, and the rules um, will basically enable you to say, well, actually, it doesn't need to go a month, it can go six weeks, two months, and then we send somebody to do the work. Um, and, and if you build rules, you can have the system generate those jobs for you. So it, it doesn't need people to keep looking at reports. You just give it the rules and let, let the system issue the jobs as and when they're needed. I hope that clarifies uh, Mr. Shan. So we've got a couple of questions as well before we run out of time. Uh, we have a question from Ms. Barbara. She says that, can you share some examples of how technology has helped maybe especially in preventive maintenance where the impact is not only on the cost, but also, as mentioned before, the experience of end users. Yeah, abs absolutely, and I'm happy to take this one. So just to um, just carry on and echo from, from Rob in terms of moving from PPM to, to CBM. Now, I had a conversation with a, a customer the other day, and we were talking about PPM. And I asked him, are his PPM schedules the same now as they were before COVID? And he sort of said, yes. And I said, why? I, I challenged him. And he sort of looked at me quizzically, and I said, "Well, in your sort of commercial um, projects, um, your your utilization has has changed. It's gone down. People are more working from home, etc." But you're still doing the same PPM. So, as as uh, Mr. Rob mentioned, you know that's that's costing you. You're going out and visiting every month rather than every two, and then basing it on condition. In your residential projects, is your PPM the same? He said, "Yes." I said, "Well, they're being utilized more." because people are working from home, etc. So you're introducing risk. Said so by continuing on your PPR, PPM, you're either wasting money or introducing risk. And he said, looked at me and said, right, so the wise thing to do is move to CBM because that changes if the environment utilization changes. Absolutely. So that not only saves money, it not only reduces risk, but it also improves the customer experience of the people utilizing those projects. So basically, everyone's a winner. 
Um, and the next stage is, as one mentioned, you know, you can set your rules based on IoT sensors and monitors, but then the next stage with that would be to add intelligence so that a person doesn't need to set the rules if the conditions in the environment utilization changes. If the system itself could interpret those changes in utilization and change those rules itself and, and take out the manual interpretation of that data, then you're creating true AI, you're creating true automation, reducing cost, uh, reducing risk and improving customer satisfaction on the service. That's the end goal. Mm. It's, uh, it's interesting what uh, the Glenn said, yes, like uh, to the machine to start learning uh, the, the new parameters when these parameters change. But answering Barbara regarding how technology helps and uh, preventive maintenance, you know, like in preventive maintenance, especially when you're dealing with, with systems such as firefighting, such as uh, uh, water pump, sweet water pump, and this kind of things. Like for us, like we have noticed that sometimes the escalation that's happening, the automatic escalation when the PPM comes and there is no response, and that escalation being done immediately, and this allowed us or the management of the, of the maintenance team to attend PPM before the time frame is passed. Because some areas, some systems that they are so essential that if the PPM is not done correctly and not done on time and not being followed up properly can impact the whole life uh, system because we are dealing with such, such our, uh, clients. Uh, we have a clients like in remote areas that uh, that they they survive, actually, or their survival depends on this kind of system. And this is how technology helps us in escalation, auto-generation, and auto-update. This is all that this is Barbara's question. Mm. We also have some other questions where we got from Ms. Dana, who says that we understand the importance of digital platforms such as CAPM, but however, how about new technologies uh, that we could see implemented in FM, such as robotics, automation, uh, would that help in reducing the need for labor-intensive activities as well? Actually, if you allow me, like, please, like, you know, like, FM in Saudi Arabia, until today, like I would say, like still we are we are going to work. It's still manpower driven service, and uh, and Catherine system, Catherine system is the core business. Like we need all of. Uh, I believe my my colleagues they agree that that the Catherine system is a core, is the plan, is of all your of all your operations and activities. Even though that robotics, of course, like robotics implementation, such as like in facade cleaning, robotics cleaning, and, and, and normally cleaning for open space cleaning, are going to reduce not only the manpower, as, as well the time frame that required to do the same service. So both, both they speak to each other, as Glenn said, the system needs to learn the new parameters. So the CATHAM system is the brain, and the robotics will integrate with each other to provide that service. Okay. What are the other kind of trends that you're seeing that uh, are impacting this whole transformation of, uh, you know, towards the whole digital path that we're talking about? Uh, are there any other trends that are affecting the market? Uh, I, I think, uh, obviously, we've, we've spoken about IoT. Yeah. Uh, but, but IoT um, is um, a major factor that will, will assist uh, building performance. So we're, we're you know, I think we all know we're moving away from building management to building performance, and there's these key differentiators between the two. I think IoT is is a way to do that, and having multiple uh, other sensory arrays as well that can be non-intrusively retrofitted. So, you know, you can build, uh, you you can bring relatively uh, older projects up to code. Uh, we we did a, a project in the UK uh, where we took a 16th century building. And we brought it up to the same technology as the shard in the UK, non-intrusively. So if we can do it on a 16th century building, we can do it on most of the buildings in the kingdom. Uh, yeah. So that's it. And, and, and that's going to be coupled with 5G. So the, the, the capacity for, for 5G networks and IoT sensors and IoT everything uh, to be able to ingest uh, millions, hundreds of millions of, of data streams and take that data, turn it into information and turn that into knowledge to act upon uh, I, I think it's going to be uh, going to drive a digital transformation as well. Um, Mr. Rob, would you like to add to that? Um, I, I just really yeah. agree on the yeah, IoT is um, is certainly one of the big 
the big drivers forward. Um, like I said, I think previously BIM um, has said has been a key word, but um, yeah. key words. we still shouldn't underestimate the, the importance of it. Um, and ultimately, um, certainly for the you know the new buildings that are going up in Saudi, having BIM models and having that information there at a quality that's good enough for the you know the service providers and the building managers and the FMs to, to work with, not just the construction companies. Uh, that's important. Yeah. But uh, where do you think that the FM companies should now invest in terms of this whole uh, digital transformation journey? It's in fact one of the questions also that's being asked. So I'm putting the ball on both your foot. So yeah. where do you think they should invest? <laughs> now to be well, quite I, neutral about it. <laughs> yeah, from, from the, the companies we're talking to, like I say, they're, they're buying CAFM systems for, for the first time. Um, and, and they're going from you know, paper based or Excel sheets to a CAFM system with mobility as well. Um, and and you know, the gains that that gives them is, is, is huge initially. Um, so I think get that in place and get that working and get, get, get the skills and the knowledge. Um, and it will, it will progress from there. I agree with all that, actually. You know, uh, we need to start from somewhere. And as I say, like the technology can offer you like an a card. Like you can have everything in technology. You can have the BIM, you can have the BMS, you can have, you can, you can have. But I believe from facility management, you need first of all to start with your CAFM system. We need to bring CAFM system that understand your need and can deliver the client's expectation. Uh, sometimes, you know, like in CAFM system, or over, you can uh, uh, also comment about the CAFM system. You have different CAFM systems that you can use. And the FM company, before start choosing a CAFM system, they need to understand what they are using, what kind of modules that they are using in CAFM system. What I believe uh, that FM companies, they should start with CAFM system, with the right modules, the right understanding and to ensure that their CAFM system can talk with their clients and can talk with their workers. You don't want to bring a CAFM system can speak or, or can go one dimension. The, then one will make a benefit, the other will not make any benefit. So this is where I believe you start with, start with the CAFM system and from the CAFM system you can have the PDAs and you can have anything. But you need to start good investment in CAFM system and talented people behind the CAFM system because the modules need talent people to invest and to work with that. Yeah. I, I also think um, I also think we've already we, we spoke about the kingdom, you know, catching up. We spoke about the the, the kingdom and the start of this journey. I, I also think that the kingdom is in a fantastic position to take advantage of what's happening uh, in the rest of the world. Uh, and in the rest of the world, CAFM isn't CAFM isn't the be all and end all. It's a really really good starting block. Um, but, but what we're seeing from the, 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 the Skanskis of this world, from the JLLs of this world, from some CBREs of this world, is that they're, they're taking CAFM and having it as a core platform, but overlaying an intelligence layer above that, that can operate portfolio-wide, while the CAFM still does the instruction, the intelligence is that intelligence layer. So whether that's a, a building performance management system, whether that's a, an intelligent layer, I mean, obviously, Shepard, has one, and I'm sure Bob, Bob's FSI has one as well, that can take your BMS, that can take your utility stuff, that can take your IoT sensors, that can pull in and push out to a CAFM system while over, giving an overriding uh, holistic view from a, a strategic and portfolio-wide company uh, a perspective. So I think the King can take advantage of not necessarily having to wait a few years and, until it's become more mature to say, okay, there's the next stage, we're ready to go for that now. I think there's an opportunity to have a look at that level of technology and bring that in now and accelerate the adoption and accelerate the value towards the digital transformation end goal rather than waiting, waiting, waiting and, and understanding right with this stage, you know, four or five years down the line. Let's start looking and get it now. Let's start accelerating the adoption of this extra layer above CAFM uh, and bring that in to, to the benefit of everyone and really driving value. Yeah. 
So we, uh, there's also another question where uh, you know we're talking about the ROI and the FM business growth when it comes to investing in all these digital technologies. But how? What do you see, and what kind of expectations do you have when we align it to the much larger vision of KSA Vision 2030? You know, uh, uh, in, like in technology, you can all of this that comes from different from different layers. Like my colleagues are saying that there is a technology can and like the BIM, like they take like the consideration, the BIM. The BIM, you know, like, like let me start from this point. Facility management usually comes at the end after the construction is done, after design is done, construction is done, facility management comes in. And actually this, this should start changing if you want to see more ROI and you want to see a benefit over your, your facility management. BIM allows FM companies to be involved design prospect during the construction prospect and delivery and here when you when you have that kind of of, uh, of, uh, of understanding of facility management concept that should not come at the end and start coming from the beginning of the asset life cycle you can see the benefit of the technology that you're investing in otherwise if you're going to bring the fm in the end and start the fm to do the investment of of the infrastructure for technology the infrastructure of IoT and all that kind of things, the ROI, it will be more uh, on the time frame. But I believe as I'm starts from the beginning, from the design, we're going to have a positive ROI in less time period. Right. There's also a question about, you know, research and development being a very crucial part of our organizations that kind of bring in innovation. So do you feel that uh, the Saudi FM service providers should invest in R&D as well? Yeah. And this is what we are <laughs> the future, because if, uh, if, if like companies such as FSI and others are not coming with a new technology and allowing service providers of exploring the uh, possibilities that they were not there before, we will not be able to deliver the quality the client is expecting us to provide. Now we are talking about mega projects such as Neom. Neom is going to be the technology, it's going to be the future. And the companies who invest heavily in R&D are the companies are going to be matching the pace and the changes in the market. Otherwise, these companies are not going to be there anymore. So yes, R&D is important and, and I can see many companies in Saudi Arabia that are investing in that. Okay. And also there's a question uh, from Nuzin who says that why is it so hard for clients to trust in IoT and AI and FM? When, because they all they keep asking is for manpower like in parties and they still want someone manning the entrances and exits, and the exits when it's actually automated. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think everyone wants to went out today. <laughs> I'm like, why? I think it's by habit. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I think the only solution is maybe we you know we should do more, you know, um, such awareness uh, campaigns, and hopefully, you know, things are changing, and we hope that things do change in the future. Yeah, it's just a behavior. My colleagues, they, they agree. It's just a behavior. You know, like the behavior will take time to change, and and the human being, like usually, they they tend to go with the comfortable zone, and the comfortable zone in this area is the manpower. Like if you have a if you have a person that you see it makes your life easy. Don't say that person, even if there is a service, you'll be like a little bit shocked. And this is I think that's only a behavior. It will change. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're all hopeful too. Any closing thoughts as we're almost coming to the end of our discussion? Sorry, uh, sorry uh, like, like from our side, you know, like uh, Saudi Arabia is, is uh, changing and changing rapidly. Like, uh, like from my experience in Saudi Arabia, every every month there is something different happening, and to cope up with that change and the pace, the quick pace or fast pace is happening in technology internationally as well. The demand of the market is uh, it's a challenge. But with partners uh, such uh, such FSI and others in the market, it is a very good uh, chance for everyone to take a part in this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say that um, you know, Saudi and you know, the Middle East in general uh, has its unique requirements. Um, FSI is a global company. We, we take 
um, sort of feeds back to our HQ from our various offices around the world. Um, and we always come up with slightly different take on, on, on what we feed back and, and, and how it affects people. Um, so because of our R&D, we don't do it purely um, in the UK office. We, you know, we provide a lot of feedback and we have a lot of input into that because there are specific requirements that are very centric to, to this region. And Instagram? Yeah, I, I, to echo Rob, really, um, the, the region does have its nuances, uh, but I, I, I still think it's a, uh, an exciting time. And the, uh, the, the challenges uh, and also the opportunity of driving more, more technology focused service provision um, through, throughout the built environment. Uh, the, I think, as uh, Ms. Mohammed said, uh, the behavior uh, will, will, will take longer than the technology. <laughs> And so I, I think if you can uh, match both uh, an education uh, and awareness of what's available and what's possible will then bring around the, the trust uh, and then, you know, people might start uh, understanding that money is not necessarily for something you can see, but it's for something you can experience. So it doesn't have to be the man stood there operating the gate if that can be automated. Absolutely. Yeah. I think it definitely, you know, got so many key insights from this discussion where, you know, where we can see that there is a hunger, there is an appetite and we can see that kind of change. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had so much of uh, development happening in the kingdom, like what we are witnessing in the last couple of years, at least. And now with the kind of establishment and the vision that uh, the region has, we definitely hope to see more growth uh, when it comes to technology. So. You know, as all of you said, we are all hopeful for the change in mindset and, of course, you know, catch up with the technology that is there uh, in the market. So thank you, everyone, for, you know, making time out for us today and uh, being thank here you. and being as engaging as possible. Thank you very much, Megha. Thank you. Very, thank you. Thank and you. thank you, Anishit Sadi, as well, for supporting us. Uh, you know our initiative out here and uh, if any of you want to know more uh, you know, key insights about the kingdom we do have a new sector uh, column that we've opened up on our website so do have a look at that and uh, until next time do stay safe thank you very much have a good day thank you, thank you. take care